So good to be with you guys and continuing uh, our conversation about preaching and preaching justice to the people of God. Let me start with just a confession. I am a little bit intimidated. You call this thing a PhD colloquium. I, I am a PhD dropout, and, uh, and so, uh, but I am a professor. Not, not in the sense of many of you, but I profess to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, <laughs> and uh, he's going to have to be enough <laughs> for us as we talk right now. Um, it, on Tuesday, we try to think of justice as a vital part of the good life and um, try to think about that life into which we are called as Christians and what makes it good in some sense and was arguing from the Proverbs, from the wisdom literature, that um, justice is at least one of those things that's essential to the good life. And today, with God's help, I want to encourage us to preach justice as a vital part of fulfilling the Great Commission. So we want to think not only about that life into which we have been brought, but we want to think about now that calling upon us to spread the good news of the gospel and the life that accompanies it to all the nations of the earth. And I want to contend that unless we have a healthy understanding and eye toward biblical justice, we won't be making the kinds of disciples that the Lord has in mind, and we won't be bringing the nations into the kind of good life that the Lord has in mind for his people. So let's start in the obvious place, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. You will know these words. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And he gives us the consequence. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. As you know, that text begins and ends with tremendous encouragement. It begins with the authority that our Lord claims for himself. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. One is made to think of the vision that Daniel has of the Ancient of Days and one like the Son of Man coming to him and receiving authority and wisdom and majesty and dominion and the nations praising him. And he not only receives that authority, but we encourage also by how the text ends, he attends us in that power, in that authority. He is with us always until the end of the age. It's a marvelous thing that the one that's with us is the one that has all authority and power. And in the middle, he gives us the, the application of that truth, that he has authority, and that is we are then in that authority to go into all the nations and to make disciples. We are to baptize them. We are to teach them to observe all that he has commanded. So this text makes us a missionary people. There are no Christian people who are not missionary people. If we think so, then we have a defective understanding of what it means to be Christian people. We are a sent people. But this text also puts obedience, not just conversion, on the missionary agenda. We are to not only obey all that the Lord has commanded ourselves, but more fundamentally to the missionary calling, we are then to teach others to do likewise, to obey all that the Lord has commanded. And so this text calls us to spread a way of thinking and a way of living in which Jesus is acknowledged as Lord of all among all the nations. It calls us into that good life, really, that we were thinking about on Tuesday. Now, the operative uh, part of this text that I sort of want to lift out here is, is what we see at the beginning of verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, that's tricky language in one sense. It's tricky because of, I think if we sort of hear the language of obedience and commands and think in terms of law, and once again, we, we may have a hearing impairment. We may be suspicious of any emphasis on obedience as essentially being legalism. And there's a kind of antinomian tendency that some of us may feel. The other thing is we may come to this text and we hear the Lord exhorting us to obedience of his commands and we, we may not necessarily be given to an antinomian spirit, but we may be given to, uh, how shall we call it, um, a kind of shrinking spirit. 
where the commandments are, are so reduced, both in their, in their reach, in their number, in their scope, in their power, in their spiritual import, that it really does become a matter of kind of checklist Christianity. Right? Well, that's not how Jesus thinks about the law, is it? It's not how he thinks about his commandments. So let's stay in Matthew and think about what our Lord tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 19, where he, in that great, maybe greatest of sermons, he meditates a little bit on the law. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now that's, a, that's an interesting commentary on the law there from our Lord. We, he says he's come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And we see this fulfillment in at least two ways, ways in which we are customarily thinking about the Lord's fulfillment. He is uh, our active obedience and our passive obedience. He has fulfilled all the requirements of the law in his sinless, perfect, without blemish obedience to God. And then he has suffered the consequence of the law, the curse of the law, on the cross as he atones for our sins and dies in our place. And in both ways, Christ has fulfilled the, the righteous requirements of the law for all those who believe in him. But it's interesting, as you keep sort of thinking in this text, in these three verses, and indeed in the rest of the sermon, I, I think there's another sense here fulfilled that we ought to have in mind that, that maybe sometimes slips our notice in our preaching. I think he points to it in verse 19 where he says there, therefore, so he's not come to abolish, but to fulfill the law. Not one small punctuation mark will pass away until it's all accomplished. Then he gives us the application in verse 19. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, there we're in the language of missions, aren't we? Go and teach people to observe the commandments. But here he's pointing out something about that teaching of observation that we ought to take note of, that if we relax the commandments of God, if we relax the law, if we teach others to loosen the law, to relax it, well, we're not great in the kingdom, we're least in the kingdom. And when you read the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus seems to be giving us a, a fuller explication of the law. He says things like, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Right? So that adultery is not made up simply of taking another's covenant partner. Adultery actually begins in the spirit of the law with lust and looking on another, you know, lust in your heart. Murder isn't sort of summed up by actually taking another's life. Murder begins with that hatred that occurs in the heart. So he, he fills out the law, not just the letter, but the spirit of the law as he explicates it. That's what I think he means in part in the Great Commission about teaching others to observe. Not merely the letter, but also the spirit. And that's what I think he means in part by not relaxing the law, not, not sort of making it less than by merely focusing on the, the dictates, the, the, the letter of the law, but also communicating and teaching people to observe the spirit of the law as well. And we see this later in Matthew's Gospel. So the question becomes for us, what does the Lord command that we spread as a way of thinking and living in this great commission? And, and one part of the answer is the Lord commands us to observe or to do justice in the sort of expanded fulfillment with which he teaches us in Matthew 5. So we're still in Matthew's gospel. If you look at me, look with me in one more text, Matthew 23, verses 23 to 24. You will know this section uh, of Matthew's gospel and our Lord's back and forth with the Pharisees and the pronouncement of these series of woes against the Pharisees, this fourth woe here in Matthew 23. We read these words, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. 
These you ought to have done without neglecting the others, you blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Now, it's interesting, I think, as you read this, this rebuke of the scribes and the Pharisees in, in light of what we read in Matthew 5 and, and what we read in uh, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, I, I think we're seeing here an illustration of those who have loosened the law with a kind of scrupulous particularity but miss the whole sort of weightier meaning and essence of the law, the big part of the law. So they, they tithe all their household garden plants, mint and cumin and dill. They are scrupulous about that. In some ways, they've gone beyond the law in that scrupulosity. They've taken the requirements of the tithe and, and have, with exacting obedience, applied it to, to everything, down to the least little things. And it's striking. Jesus does not rebuke them for that. He doesn't rebuke them for that kind of scrupulosity. He actually rebukes them for missing the forest. They're counting the trees, but they miss the weightier matters of the law, which he defines here as justice and mercy and faithfulness. So we must think and live with integrity. These men are, as Jesus says, hypocrites. Again, they have made themselves hypocrites by, to use that, that, that funny picture he uses in the next verse, by straining at gnats and swallowing camels. You know, by taking this little insect that would have been unclean and defiling and making sure that the, the strain or the net was so tight that a gnat couldn't get through, and yet leaving the mouth wide open for a whole camel. Right? They're defiled in huge things, but looking to be clean in small things. And, and we ought to avoid that kind of hypocrisy. And we certainly ought to avoid the exportation of that form of hypocrisy in, in our missions work. Right? So one wonders if we are fulfilling the Great Commitment, Commission if what we export is a kind of ethic that pays very close attention to what might be regarded as lighter matters of the Scripture. But at the same time, goes into countries rife with injustice, rife with a need for mercy, rife with a need for steadfastness, or referring to Luke eleven forty two, love, and fail to teach people to observe those weightier matters of the law. What's at the heart of our missionary impulse? Is it merely to get people to convert, to make decisions? Or is it to get people upon converting to enter this way of living, to observe the heavy things, the deep things of God's word, the letter as well as the spirit of God's word. Jesus would, I think, have us think about the spirit, the heavier, the weightier things. And in our preaching, I think it's important for us to learn to see the difference between, for lack of a better word, the lighter and the weightier matters of the law. As I said before, the Pharisees were not sort of rebuked here for taking tithing seriously. They, they dedicated themselves to that. But there was a myopia that developed. There was a nearsightedness that developed. They became so scrupulous about the details, as we've been saying, they missed the major issues, the major problems that were before them. They hugged the proverbial trees, not recognizing that they were in a forest. And so they became blind guides. And as a church, we never want to send blind guides to other countries. We never want to send people with this kind of squint to look at the cultures and the peoples and the needs of other countries. And we must not be those who build their religious identities and reputations on relatively small banners. I mean, if we build our reputations on these small matters while neglecting the law, the weightier matters of the law, we will indeed be hypocrites who misrepresent Christ and misrepresent Christian living. So we need to make this distinction so we might be able to teach uh, others and we might be able ourselves to give proper weight and proportion to the things of God. We've all seen Christians who've gotten things out of proportion. You know, maybe they're all caught up in tithing like these Pharisees, and that's the big argument they bring to the church. Maybe they've discovered the doctrine of election. God forbid they should come to your church and, 
And they want to work it into every conversation and drive every theological issue through that, um, through that sieve. Or perhaps they're, fina- they're fascinated by prophecy. And they're willing to call everyone who disagrees with their prophetic scheme, their end time scheme, a heretic. So prophecy becomes the litmus test for orthodoxy. Or they could be caught up with politics. And that has taken over their faith. There are plenty of examples. We've all seen people who've gotten things out of balance. And when we get things out of proportion, we see in this carnival mirror, don't we? These disfigured shapes, almost comical sometimes, uh, as we strain at gnats and swallow camels. And so we want to get the relative importance of God's commands correct. But then, having gotten the proportion correct in our preaching, we want to insist on obedience to both, the lighter, so-called, and what Jesus calls the weightier matters of the law. You see there, he says, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. And I don't know about you, but I characteristically find myself falling off one side of the horse or the other. You know, I, I'm dating myself here, but I often feel like those people in the old commercials, I, I should have had a V8, you know, and gotten set up right. Everybody under 40 has no idea what I'm talking about. (laughs) So the the Great Commission requires we learn and then teach the nations this this sort of big picture, balanced and proportioned of what God has commanded us, what Christ demands of us, that we obey everything that the Lord has commanded. And just to come to our sort of particular topic of justice, he states that very plainly there in the text in Matthew 23, verse 23. And we ask ourselves, what is justice? Well, I love the definition that Dr. King gave of justice in 1955 at the launch of the Montgomery uh, bus boycott. He says, justice is love correcting everything that revolts against love. Justice is love in work clothes. It's what love does when it finds itself confronted with something that is uh, in many ways rebelling against that greatest of Christian virtues, love itself. Justice puts it back in order, causes love to reign. Mercy, then, I I would suggest, sort of using my own little definition, is love stooping to help a battered neighbor. So justice is what love does when it faces the oppressor. Mercy is what love does when it faces the oppressed. Justice stops by and says, no more, stop it, the way Moses did to Pharaoh. Mercy stops by and says, let me help you. And here, Matthew uses the third here, faithfulness. Again, in Luke eleven forty two, 42, Luke uses instead of faithfulness the phrase, the love of God. And I th- tend to think that that's what Matthew has in mind as well. Well, faithfulness is that love that will not stop loving that keeps on in love, that love that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that love that never fails. So Jesus is pointing to the necessity for true godliness and true righteousness at the heart of our religion. The law is not a matter of mere details and regulations, but of serving our covenant God from our hearts, as one writer puts it. As Micah puts it, Micah 6, 8, he has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And the question is, is that what we see as the charge of the Great Commission, the aim of the Great Commission? Do we preach for that end? Do we disciple for that end? Do we train missionaries and send them for that end? Are we sending them for something more meager, smaller, less encompassing, less compelling. What are we exporting in our missionary efforts? Are people groups more just as a consequence of our missions? Are people groups more merciful as a consequence of our missions? Are people groups more faithful or loving as a consequence of our mission? If not, we're not teaching the nations to obey everything Christ has commanded. We're leaving off the weightier matters of the law and calling it mission or discipleship. So, when it comes to preaching, I think we want to return to a healthy habit of doing a good law work, as the Puritans might put it, of preaching the law well, 
not as a grounds for justification. But by works of the law, no man will be justified. And we're justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But does that then make the law of no consequence to the Christian? Well, certainly not. The law is holy. And so in a sense, we, what I'm advocating here is that we use the law in our preaching in all three senses, in its civil, evangelical, and didactic sense. By civil, I do not mean a theocratic use. Rather, simply, I mean the law calls us to the support of good government. We see that it's clearly in Romans 13. The law is a basic part. The civil law is a basic part of how God uses the sword and rewards the righteous. It's a basic part of how justice prevails in good government. So the law still coerces in that sense. That's his first use. But Jesus seems to be using the law in Matthew 23 in an evangelical sense here. He is attempting to convict them of their sins of omission and bring them to repentance. He's attempting to terrorize them with the law, to have them hear the barking of the law and to see the revealed fangs of the law and to, in conscience, be stricken and afraid at the terrors of the law, all with an eye toward repentance. It's the second use of the law. We need that in our preaching if we're going to produce people who care about justice. And as Christian, this text still, the law still teaches us, though we are not under the law for just justification, it teaches how we are to live. It requires obedience. That's the third use of the law. And of course, it's obedience the Lord demands in the Great Commission. And apart from teaching obedience, we are far from fulfilling the Great Commission. We really are. One wonders if we don't see more progress in making disciples because of our intent to obey and to teach others to obey is ill-informed or small. Why is the calling to go so frequently thought of in mystical terms? Rather more simply, in terms of obedience to a Lord who has all authority. Why must we work hard to raise up people to go to the mission field when a Lord who requires it of them had called it so plainly. Might it be that part of the problem, not all of the problem, but might it be that part of the problem is that so many of us have begun our Christian lives with almost no category for obedience. That faith is cut off from obedience. But the Bible in Romans 1 calls us to that obedience that comes from faith. And Jesus can tell us in the Gospels in John 14, John 15, why do you call me Lord and do not do what I say? Or if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And my Father and I will come to you and make our home with you. Well, for that promise and that reality, that communion to be rich and true and right, then we need some conception of obedience, don't we? As a healthy, happy, normal part of what it means to follow Jesus. Indeed, quite at the heart of what it means to follow Jesus, since to call him Lord means that our life is not our own, belongs to him. That our plans are not our own, that the plans he has for us. That we are ones who obey and submit. And, and we must do that in regards to justice. We must do that in regards to mercy. We must do that in regards to love. And further to the point, justice, mercy, and love has to be defined not by us, but by our Lord. By his word. The limits of it, the scope of it, the content of it, the, the thrust of it, all has to be determined by what he has said in his word. And so when we hear this command from the Lord to, to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God, or to be faithful and steadfast in love, it's meant to drive us right back to the biblical text, right back to the word of God, to freshly mine again what thus saith the Lord. To understand in a renewed way, not in a fallen and worldly way, but with renewed minds what God has called us to in this quest. Now, this is critical that we do this as preachers because it's not something people just do in their quiet times. It's not something people just do in the course of their private and personal study. It's one of the ways we have to lead them. It's part of our crook. It's part of our task to help them drink from these waters, these waters that are so often neglected and so often misrepresented in this fallen world. 
So we won't be fulfilling the Great Commission if we don't lead people to understand the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and steadfastness or faithfulness, love. And the question for us is, do we teach them these weightier matters? Do we orient their lives, our people's lives, to these things as the big things, the most important things, the things without which we're hypocrites? Or is our religion pharisaical? Is it essentially hypocritical? Does it focus on the small things with great attention and exacting detail? while missing the really big things. There's an irony here. Many of us shy away from the law for fear of becoming Pharisees. When if we would actually embrace the law properly, it would keep us from being Pharisees. And so how much of our religion is Pharisaical? How much of our piety is Pharisaical? And how much of it is in keeping with our Lord's command? in keeping with his spirit. So my invitation in these lectures is for us to do this spade work, to dig into the scriptures, to develop a fresh a theology that puts at the center of the Christian life, along with other things, love, mercy, so on, a big view of justice, a robust view of justice, to have that animate our Christian lives as part of the definition of the good life and have that animate our Christian teaching as part of fulfillment of the Great Commission. And tomorrow, Lord willing, we will see that it needs to also animate our worship, that apart from this, this is not the worship that the Lord accepts and finds pleasing. We just, I'm just, uh, I was invited to do these lectures and talk about something that has been heavy on my heart. And this is just really heavy for me in the church right now. Is that we would, we would lay hold to this gladly. And that this here is the Bible and our Lord's command and what he teaches us about justice and what it looks like for justice to, to rain down. The blessing that results to people, Christian and non-Christian. The cost that it exacts from us sometimes normal, sometimes high, always right. And that we would be, we'd have more integrity than the Pharisees in our witness, in our witness to our families, in our witness to our neighbors, in our witness in the public square, that we'd be known as the just people, the righteous ones, the ones who take the right and good and loving position on every issue, do so imperfectly and do so humbly, but do so earnestly and do so consistently for the glory of our Lord and for the blessing of the nations that Christ might be seen as beautiful and the life that he calls us to might be desirable. All of us are imperfect. We put our pants on one leg at a time. There will always be some charge of hypocrisy, particularly from the cultured despisers of Christianity. But don't let that sort of stop us from pursuing what is good and right and holy that our Lord holds out before us. And so may he give us grace to preach justice to the people of God. And may he give us grace to live justly in a perishing world. And may we see this as the weightier matter and do both the lesser and the weightier together. Let me pray for us. Father, we do thank you for the gift of preaching. We thank you for how you take feeble words, how you take stammering tongues, how you sometimes take even incomplete thoughts and forgettable illustrations, and you do work in human hearts, and you do cause people to be born again, and you do sanctify us and by degrees help us to grow in holiness and the likeness of Christ. And we praise you that you do all of that as a gift to us. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. We cannot demand it. 
Our salvation from beginning to end is a matter of grace. You bring us in through faith and you keep us by faith and you, in your kindness, undeserved kindness to us, you carry on your work in us until the day of Christ when you will complete it. You're so good and so loving. And you call us as those who are known by your name to also be good and loving, to be just and true. And we do admit that for far too many of us, our, our thoughts about how to follow you with regard to justice and mercy and faithfulness are too often formed by sources other than your Bible, by wisdom other than heavenly wisdom. And no wonder it is too often confusing and upsetting and even divisive. But if you would give us a heart to return to your word, If you would give us a heart to take seriously your word, if you would give us a mind to submit to you and to obey you in matters small and great and to get the balance right and the proportion right and to work it out in our individual lives, in our church lives and in the public square, to be impartial in our pursuit of justice and to be biblical in our definition of it. If you would give us that grace, We do trust that you would be made beautiful in the sight of all. That you would exalt yourself and glorify yourself and bless your church. And you might finish the the great calling that you've placed on our lives to see all the nations worship you. So grant us grace, yet more grace, and more grace still. For we're a needy people, and apart from you, we can do nothing. Oh Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, thank you very much. We do want to open the floor now for questions. Please do remember to keep your questions relatively brief, uh, to ask only one, and that way everybody in the room who has a question on their mind will have the opportunity to pose it. All the hard questions go to Dr. Strickland. (laughs) Appreciate your word today. Just wanted to ask, what does um, an emphasis on obedience look like in discipleship for you? So if you have two new believers that you're discipling, what what does that look like? Looks like reading the Bible and uh, asking what does the Bible say? What does it mean by what it says? And how does it apply to your life? It just looks like inductive Bible study. And um, sort of asking further questions about, you know, how would you apply this given your particular life and um, what kinds of things might be in keeping with this text, what kinds of things are out of step with the text. Uh, I think it was Mark Lauterbach in um, Transforming Community uh, that uh, was talking about church discipline in a particular section. And he, he basically made an argument that, or an illustration that I thought was compelling. He said, basically, when it comes to, say, something like discipline, uh, whether formative or corrective, he's talking about corrective at the time, he says, um, if, you, if you cannot open the Bible to a pertinent text, have the person put their finger on it, read it in context, uh, interpret it and conclude what you have concluded, um, then it may be you, you don't, in, in that argument, don't have a proper grounds for, for discipline. Um, or you haven't, you haven't taught very well. And so that, that idea of just opening the text, putting your finger on the text, let's read it together, let's discuss it, let's then sort of say, let's apply it, um, that, that's very simply, very simply it. And, and sometimes it's just, in the preaching, it's a, it's a, I find this need to sort of constantly remind people of our, of our most basic Christian confession. Jesus is Lord. And Jesus, what, part of what that means is we obey him, right? I just think Christians leak, right? Uh, they're truths we have to be told over and over again, even the most basic truths. Um, and so sometimes good preaching is just simply repetitive preaching. You know, it's not like we get everything the first time we heard it, right? And it's not like our people get everything the first time uh, we, we teach it. And, and in fact, if we're honest, the Lord, if we've learned anything from the Lord, he's probably taught it, taught it to us over and over again over a period of time. Um, and so we should be like the apostle and say, it's, it's no trouble for me to remind you of these things. Uh, and so in that, in, that repetition, in that repetition, I think is sort of acquisition. Um, and so just, 
just to calling people to obey uh, and to obey from justification, not for justification. Um, understand that, that having been justified freely by grace, we've also then been freed uh, to pursue the things that God has called us to. And uh, that's as simple as read your Bible, interpret your Bible, apply your Bible. And, and on this question of justice in particular, it's the last thing I'll say. On this question of justice in particular, um, I'm just, boy, we really do have to do this with our Bibles open, right? Uh, because I think just the, just the language itself, just the language of justice, that word has been sort of conceded to the left, right? And so there's a suspicion in a lot of people that just even using the word means you're liberal, right? Well, what does that mean? It means, well, they're first thinking about the idea in worldly categories, Right? Left, right, red, blue, so on. And what we want to do is get our people back to the habit of thinking about this set of issues in biblical categories, informed by biblical teaching, um, in the law, in the prophets, in the wisdom literature, in the gospels. Um, so they're hearing what Jesus means when we use that language, as opposed to hearing what other people mean uh, when we hear that language. Uh, Professor Anyamwile. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Amen. My name is Andrew. I'm here, a PhD student at Southeastern. Uh, I think a couple things you said really resonated. One is you said um, that justice is love with work clothes on. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time with work and I've been spending a lot of time with justice and I think that resonates with me. Another thing that you said is uh, sort of this, what does love look like in um, relationship to the oppressed? And then what does love look like in relationship to the oppressor? And so love to the oppressor. I'm, um, I'm sorry, I, I, beat my, I beat my timer, so that's the first time ever. Wow. You guys were witnesses. <laughs> this is setting a new bar. It is. <laughs> um, so in a sense, I think you said, um, if I'm remembering correctly, you said love towards the oppressed looks like mercy. Mm -hmm. Love towards the oppressor looks like justice. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me personally, I've spent time on the mission field, um, and in those situations, I've very much been the oppressed. In our culture, I am very much come in the clothes of the oppressor. Mm -hmm. And so at times, in some places in our culture, I am treated as the oppressed, and sometimes I am treated as the oppressor. Mm -hmm. Would you have any counsel for those of us who kind of feel that tension in some spheres, we're talking to people and we need to come to them with mercy. Mm -hmm. Some people we need to come with justice and it's a really hard dynamic. Mm -hmm. So any counsel that you would give for, for that? Yeah, I first would say I think um, it's a really good question and I think if we're paying attention we will all find ourselves in one of those positions or the other, right? So I'm, I'm keenly aware that as, as a man I, I enjoy uh, privileges and things inside the church, outside the church, that many women do not, right? Um, and, and so I think if we're paying attention, we can find ourselves positioned in, in relative privilege or, or status, um, you know, in, in differing situations, occupying different spaces in that. And so I think it's important for us to be aware of that. And that's not unlike the Apostle Paul's experience, is it? So Paul could go to some towns, get beaten and drug out and left for dead, Right for nothing but preaching the gospel, we could be hounded by Jewish believers, uh, Jewish people who did not believe the gospel and were were chasing after him to persecute him, um, and so he he knew that. But he could also go to Jerusalem, and on behalf of the Gentile, use his standing in the church to argue for their full inclusion without any other requirements. What's he doing there? Well, he's using his privilege in the situations where he has privilege to advocate not for himself, but for others who are on the margins. Uh, and this is, I think, a fundamental part of how, when you read, for example, Colossians 4, 10 to the close of the letter, when Paul goes through all those people who are with him sending their greetings, um, this is it's a really remarkably diverse team. You've got slaves and doctors. You've got Colossians and Jews. Um, you, you just got just the whole gamut. And you ask yourself the question, well, how does Paul achieve that? I think it's because he achieves, it. he achieves it in part by using his advantages, not for himself, but for others, uh, and, and then actually actively including those others who had been marginalized in the work of the ministry. I mean, think about it. There, there are at least two pieces of scripture, three, 
Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon um, that are likely carried hundreds of miles in the hand of a slave. This is God-inspired, infallible word entrusted to someone who had no standing in society. Now, the question is, is that, is that how we do ministry? Do we entrust and empower people that way? Do we take risk on people in that way? I can tell you, if, if, if I'm Onesimus, and Paul's like, yo, take this letter to your slave master. So Paul, you're taking a risk, bro. <laughs> you're taking a risk. I don't know if no roads go that way, Paul. I, you know, I, uh-uh. But that's precisely what the apostle does, right? Um, and so I think, I think you're right, brother. I, I don't think there's a way to escape the fact that we will be in relative advantage or disadvantage in differing relationships, right? Um, and, um, and I think what's key is, is that we center the right perspectives in those situations. And so I think it's right, as, to, as Paul, just to use him as an example again, when he takes that beating at the hand of Roman soldiers, he asks that question, uh, you beat me, a Roman citizen? Right? He, he wasn't considering the Roman soldier. <laughs> you know, he wasn't putting the Roman soldier at the center of the conflict. He was putting himself as a marginalized and mistreated person at the center of a conflict and invoking his civil rights, so to speak. Right? But when he goes to Jerusalem and nobody's beating him, but he's an apostle among the other apostles, recognized as an authority in the church, he doesn't center himself in that. He centers Timothy and Gentiles to make sure they're not marginalized. Um, and so I think we've got to be better at putting at the center uh, of these sort of dynamics the persons who are most uh, alienated uh, and marginalized. In it. So I hope that some of that somewhere touches on your question. Amen. Praise God. Um, my name's Kyle Smith. I'm in the uh, theology program in ethics. Um, and my question is, I guess, a little bit complicated, actually. It has to do with both of your responses I, so I far. I expect that from someone in the ethics program. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you, you pointed out in your first response that a lot of the time we seem to have conceded justice to the left. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the time it seems like that's an unconscious assumption. We just react to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering... In the context of what you were just talking about with uh, the relational dynamics of authority, how do we help people in whether students or congre in a in a congregation? How do we help people one realize that they've made that concession, that that there's something there in their conception of justice that needs correcting, and then begin to actually correct it? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Uh, I think the first thing is is just to show it the word. I mean, really, quite literally, just to have people notice that the word is a Bible word. It's in the Bible, like a thousand times, right? Um, and, and just to sort of say, okay, even at that level, can, can we agree that this, the Bible is talking about this thing called justice? We haven't defined it yet, but it's talking about this thing called justice. And um, if, if you're dealing with a tender heart and sensitive heart, I mean, that shouldn't be a hard argument to win. Um, and then I think you go on from there and say, well, what might the Bible mean? as it uses this, what are the various ways in which it's used? And, and then you're doing a word study, you know, and you're sort of thinking through uh, the Bible's use of that term, um, the various contexts in which it's used, the uh, associations that are made. So for example, um, we've been talking here about justice as it relates to correcting injustices of, of sort of one group of people or one person against others. But oftentimes the term justice is, is associated in the prophets with idolatry. Right? So, so, it's not, so if we're just thinking straight political or social issues, uh, there too we flatten the concept. Right? And so I think it's really important for us to be making all the associations that the Bible is making and uh, gaining that sense of proportion that we talk about uh, and sort of filling out their conception of justice. Another thing I think is helpful is, is just sort of helping people realize that even if they have, say, a suspicion or an allergy, to that term because they've seeded it over to the left, um, they still, because they're made in God's image, they still resonate with the term and they still act on it, right? So I would, I would be tempted to find uh, something they passionately care about that touches on injustice or immorality or things of that sort and just help them see, listen, beloved, you're, you're already a creature made to pursue this. Um, and so it may be that 
Uh, people are suspicious of Black Lives Matter kind of issues, but they don't have any problem with abortion kinds of issues, right? Well, that, that's, that's a justice instinct. That's a justice concern. That's to be encouraged and shaped by the Bible and then expand it to include other legitimate forms of, of justice and injustice. And so I would, I'd approach folks like that, not as enemies, but folks that, whose concern I simply want to grow to sort of fit the shape and scope of the Bible itself. It's a great question. Could you possibly speak to um, <clears throat> the, the challenge, the tension that uh, Christians sometimes feel because it's hard to find uh, biblical advocates for the multifaceted nature of justice. So people say, I often feel like I have to choose between which justice someone will um, fight for. So they usually do say, I always will choose for the injustice done against the unborn mm -hmm. um, rather than the injustice um, done against someone who's born. Mm -hmm. uh, and they feel the tension. Uh, can you maybe comment on, I guess, the, the trickiness of in this, when it is political or when it is issues of legislation, how a person wrestles with, I don't know how to choose for both justices when it seems like they are on different sides of the spectrum and I'm always going to choose the, the one I think trumps the other justice issues? Uh, that's a great question. It was, um, so partisanship and tribalism is a real problem in the church. And uh, praise God for 1 Corinthians and, and the way in which that's taken on in the early chapters of 1 Corinthians because I think there's a lot of I'm of Peter, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul in these kinds of discussions. Now, it's not Peter, Apollos, or Paul that people are claiming, but they're, they're sort of claiming a camp in these things. And I think the first thing for us to notice is if we're talking to a brother or sister in the Lord and we are siding up, something's wrong if we're not siding with the brother or sister in the Lord, right? Uh, that's probably the first indication that worldly categories are threatening to divide the body in a way that Christ doesn't. The second thing I'd, I'd want to say there is um, the person who says, I, I care about this and, and kind of only this or this over all other things. Uh, I don't want to say, come, take me to the Bible. Help me understand where you get that from in the Bible. Right? Um, and, and the reason I'd want to do that is because I'm, I'm not aware of a text that quite makes that argument, <laughs> uh, so I feel like I'm on, on, on home turf. But more importantly, the reason I'd want to do that is because of what we were saying earlier. It's like, okay, we should care about all the things that God cares about. And, and yes, there is, as we've been arguing in this talk, there is proportion and balance and relativity to be taken into account. But it doesn't sort of leave us the option of saying, as in your example, I only care about abortion and nothing else matters. That, that, in fact, I think we want to learn to understand to be a kind of complicitness in injustice in all those other, ma all those other matters that we talk about. And I think the perception that uh, there must be a trade-off is just a false perception. I, I, I can care about abortion. I do. I can speak up about abortion. I do. I can participate in anti-abortion things. I do. And that somehow doesn't seem to eat up and, and, and sort of push out concern I would have for something like mass incarceration, for example. Um, if, if we want to use the sort of parlance of our day, our day, I just think that's being consistently pro-life, right? Um, so I think, it's a, I think it's a discipleship matter. The other way I would put this, uh, brother, is I think for the last 40 years, evangelicals have been steadily discipled to think that because of the scale and the heinousness of abortion, that's like the only issue to care about. I think that's well intended. I just think it's an error. I just think it's an error. Um, and so we've got to, I think we've got to teach people to understand that um, others can care about more than one thing. And in fact, all of us should, you know, if we're going to care about everything the Bible cares about. <laughs> 